Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Holt. I'm a professor of nursing here at FSCJ's uh, Associate of Nursing um, Associate of Science and Nursing program. It's an honor to be here with all of you today for the FSCJ's last lecture series. When I was told I was selected for this honor by the amazing students at FSCJ, I knew exactly what I wanted to talk about. Communication. I'm not only an FSCJ professor, but I'm also an alumni. I graduated from FSCJ with my AA degree, graduated with my ASN degree and my BSN degree. So I sat in the very same seats that you all sit in in the classroom. We live in a technological world today, and back in my day we had corded phones, and it was a big deal, right, if you got a corded phone for your birthday, put it in your bedroom. Um, but as a student, we just had email, and Blackboard, of course. Um, and I remember emailing my professors and sometimes forgetting to put my name on the emails or forgetting to tell them what class I'm in. And surely, uh, because surely they know who I am, right? So a few days later, I'd get a response back from the professor, basically, who is this and what class are you in, right? So we, because today we have cell phones, I often get texts from students, right? And it's the same thing though. They text me, it's a phone number, no name. And again, I'm texting them back, who is this and what class are you in, right? Um, sometimes, however, I get a text and I'll actually call students back because it's a lot easier for me. Um, so I'll call them back and they're often very surprised when they hear me on the other line, not expecting me to call back. And I can hear what they're thinking. They're thinking, you know, I texted you because I really didn't want to have a conversation with you, <laughs> right? So because of uh, cell phone technology, it can be hard for people to effectively communicate with each other. And this is sometimes, some, these are things that I also work with my children on because often they'll be on the phone and they'll be talking to someone and all I see is their head. I don't hear anything coming out of their mouths and I have to remind them, you know, baby, nobody can see your head shaking like this. Okay. Communication matters. Relationships matter. Interactions with others matter. Whether you're talking to an advisor about enrolling in classes to your professors, coworkers, interviewing for a job, the way we communicate can create positive or negative experiences. And we all know this, and I know that all of you know this, but how often do we consciously think of it in our interactions with others? When I graduated with my ASN degree from FSCJ, um, I landed my dream job in the OR. I was so excited my first nursing job, and a lot of my students know this story. My first nursing job in the OR, I had networked throughout the year trying to get my foot in the door and I got it. First day of work, I was enthusiastic, I was excited, and I was on cloud nine. I rolled into the OR, I had a spring in my step, I had a sparkle in my eye, and I was just giddy to be there. Well, I soon realized that many of the people around me weren't interested in long conversations with their patients, or me for that matter. They were there because they didn't want to really have personal communication with their patients for too long, right? All of their patients were eventually knocked out because they're being prepped for surgery. It is an operating room after all. So if you aren't a people person, that may be the place for you to be. No offense against my my aspiring OR nurses. Unfortunately, I am a people person, so I quickly realized that the OR was not for me. There are two interesting studies that were done by Morabian and Wiener and Morabian and Ferris in the same year, two studies in the same year, 1967. And they concluded that communication is made up of 7% verbal, the words we speak, 38% tone of voice, and 55% nonverbal. 
Now, since then, these numbers have been cited over and over again at colleges and universities, as well as communication speakers that you may see online. But communication is more complex than this, and these researchers have acknowledged this. You also have to take into account the context or the environment in which the communication is taking place, the relationship between the people with the communication, and we have to look at more than just one nonverbal cue. So context, cluster of nonverbal cues, and congruency, in other words, do the words match the body language of the person that you're speaking with? Um, this formula is not absolute. It's rather a representation that there are indeed various components of communication in which the spoken word is a small part of it. So what is verbal communication? Okay. Verbal communication is not only about the words we use, but also the inflection in our voices, the way in which we say things, and the way in which we send and receive messages from others. So how does verbal communication affect us and others in our environment? Well, effective verbal communication prevents errors, prevents hostile work environments, and creates, harm, uh, creates positive working relationships. Let's talk about communication and preventing errors. In the nursing world, communication could be the difference between life and death. As an assistant nurse manager, I remember there was a time when there was a nurse who wanted to go to lunch, and in the hospital, when you go to lunch, you're supposed to hand off your patients to another nurse. And what that means is you're supposed to give them any pertinent information regarding the patients that you're leaving in their care. You know, are they a fall risk? Do they have any critical labs or any procedures coming up? So this nurse goes to lunch, leaves her patients with a male nurse. Male nurse gets a call, one of the patients needs to use the restroom. So the patient, go, he goes in, takes the female patient to the restroom, turns his back on her because he wanted to give her privacy. The patient ended up getting off the toilet, fell, hit her head, and ended up dying with a massive brain bleed. Now, what the nurse didn't know was that this patient was on heavy blood thinners. The patient's Blood work showed that the patient had a hard time clotting her blood. Um, you know, she was, her, what we call INR, was sky high. This patient shouldn't have even gotten out of the bed. But this was never conveyed to him or communicated to him at the time he took the patient out of the bed. So that's an uh, example of a lack of communication. According to the Joint Commission, 80% of errors are the result of poor communication, um, particularly in handoff reports, as the example I had just mentioned. So effective communication prevents errors, but let's talk about how effective communication can prevent hostile work environments. So what about the way you say things? Tone of voice and inflection matter. Have you ever ha had someone say something to you in an exasperated and an aggressive tone, right? We tend to mirror others in our communication. So if I say something in an exasperated, annoyed tone to you, chances are you're gonna give that right back to me. Okay, so that's something that you need to be aware of is the tone of voice and inflection. Um, it can be the difference between starting or preventing an argument, okay? Use your words. You've probably said it if you have children, or you've probably heard it. Typically, this applies to a two-year-old sitting in the back seat of the car because uh, hitting their sibling because they're touching me, right? Um, in the adult world, we don't go around smacking each other when we have a dispute, hopefully not. 
but there are techniques we can use to resolve conflict. According to Nursing 2018's Editor-in-Chief, Linda Laskowski-Jones, when talking about nurses, but this can be used in any situation, she stated that they should use the situation behavior impact technique when attempting to resolve conflict with a coworker or you know, whoever you're having the conflict with. But this, it doesn't just apply to nurses because the technique can be used in any setting. When I was in management at the hospital, I often had um, staff come in. They may have had an argument with someone or a disagreement. Um, and the first question I'd ask is, did you actually go up and speak to the person? Because, you know, maybe there was a misunderstanding, miscommunication, and most of the time they had not. So I tell them, go back to the person and speak with them first. The situation behavior impact strategy goes something like this. Situation. You say to the person, when I needed help with a task, then behavior. You laughed at me, you tell them the behavior that upset you, you laughed at me and walked away, and the impact, and that made me feel incompetent in front of my coworkers. Now, the quicker the problem is identified and addressed, the better the outcome in the environment. So sometimes the problem is too deep and needs intervention from higher ups. Um, but a word of advice, no matter what role you are in, student, professor, management, at work, whatever role you're in, try to resolve the problem with your coworkers first or with the person you're having the conflict with. And then if that doesn't work, then you can go up the chain of command. But always work up the chain of command. And as students, if you have any issues with your professors, we're very open for you where we have an open door policy so always come to see us first because we may not know that there's a problem and we may be able to fix it for you so before you go to that associate dean or the dean come to us first and talk to us okay Restating for clarification. So in nursing, we specifically read back orders that are given over the phone to clarify and confirm before placing an order. Have you ever gone through a fast food line and uh, gave an order? <coughs> Briefly looked through the bag that you got. Now, whenever I go and order fast food, it's like I'm ordering for a small army. <laughs> Okay, so I can never see through the bag to the bottom. And by the time I get home, there's normally always something that's missing, even if it's barbecue sauce, right? That's the worst. So, sorry about that. So there's a line behind you. You pull off, you get home. Part of the order is missing. Granted, it's not life and death, but honestly, after the anticipation of it all, you're pretty annoyed. Now they have those fancy little screens, so you know it's a little bit harder now for them to miss items, but it's, items still get missed. My point is when you're verbally communicating, make sure to restate and clarify information that's conveyed to you to make sure that you get it right the first time. And if you have a question, ask. That's the most important. If you have a question, if you're not sure of the information you're given, ask. And that goes for in the classroom too, okay? <clears throat> the power of kind words. <clears throat> this is my favorite. Dr. Richie Davidson from the University of Wisconsin says that kindness can be taught. It's like anything. If you practice it enough, it becomes muscle memory. So why not start off giving random compliments to your coworkers? nice shoes, I like your shoes, you look lovely today, right? Or even just smile and say hello. Um, something, pointing out something like, I liked what you said in that meeting or I liked what you said in that class, it goes a long way. According to the Random Act of Kindness Foundation, yes, that's a real foundation, kindness is contagious. And one kind act in a crowded area has the ability to affect everyone in the room who witnessed it. So let me give you an example. Um, my mom and I, we were out for breakfast one day at a little diner, 
And we're sitting there. There's a table off to the right of us of military men and women. And we knew because they were all dressed in their military fatigues. And she calls the waitress over and she says, give me their bill. So they give my mom the bill. She pays for it. Just as they're calling the waitress over to pay for it, she's like, don't worry, it's already been taken care of. They said, who, who did it? Waitress points to my mom, and of course my mom's like, no! <laughs> Each one of them got up, came over, and hugged her, and the smiles on their faces, just ear to ear. But not only smiles on their faces, but everyone in that diner had smiles on their faces because they had witnessed what she had done. The entire feel of the diner was one of positive energy. And of course, I'm not saying we all need to go out and pay for everyone's meals. <laughs> okay. Uh, but random acts of kindness, not just through action, but simply through words, can have a lasting effect not only on you, but on everyone around you. And I know students of FSCJ knows this because you volunteer all the time, right? You volunteer. We have the best volunteer turnouts in Jacksonville. Okay, so I know you all know what I'm talking about. Kindness actually increases the brain's pleasure and reward centers. Emory University calls this phenomenon a helper's high. According to Dr. Steve Post of Case Western University, when we are kind to others, everything from our physical to mental health, as well as our own satisfaction with life increases. With kindness, blood pressure decreases, serotonin increases, which is a natural antidepressant, oxytocin increases, which helps anxiety and optimism, and endorphins are released, which is the brain's natural painkiller. So I would say that being kind is a no-brainer, right? Oh, I'm so glad some snickering from that. <clears throat> so the, for those of you who are in the medical field, you know that taking care of others can be difficult and very stressful at times. And I know a lot of you who aren't in the medical field take care of loved ones at home, uh, family and friends, and it can be difficult at times. There was an interesting study done called Code Lavender, Cultivating Intentional Acts of Kindness in Response to Stressful Work Situations. And in this study, the researchers put together a kit that included kind words, chocolates, essential oils, and an employee referral, which is basically the nurses could call and speak with a counselor at no charge if they needed to get feelings out. Okay. Now, whenever a member went through um, an exceptionally difficult time, someone would bestow this kit on them. 100% of the recipients said that Code Lavender was helpful. 100% of the people who received the kits. 84% said they would recommend to others. Now, if it were me, they would have had me at chocolates. <laughs> Maybe pizza, throw in some pizza, right? So you can see kindness and kind words by extension have many health benefits. But as researcher Albert Morabian had alluded to from the previous studies, the way we communicate is not just verbal, not by a long shot. Our nonverbal communication should match our words in order to be considered genuine. Nonverbal communication. They include facial expressions. They include our body language and eye contact. How does nonverbal communication affect us and others in our environment? Well, eye contact says I'm listening. Uh, when, I'm, I, when I was in management and also teaching in the hospital, um, you know, they have these computers on wheels. They call them WOWs. They stand for workstation on wheels. But they're these big computers and they roll into the patient's rooms. And I remember one of my nurses, about four foot two, no bigger than four foot two, used to roll into the patient's room, but all the patient could see was this big computer screen, and she would stand behind it 
into the room and just stand behind the computer screen because she was terrified <laughs> to have eye contact with the patients. So I'd have to tell her, you need to stand to the side of the computer so you can have that eye contact. Body language says I'm interested and I care in what you have to say. If you stand and talk to someone with your arms on your hips, that's aggressive, right? That's an aggressive stance. And that says basically I have no time for you, I'm busy, right? Um, if you're saying you care, but you have one foot out the door and you're leaning in, that says that you don't have time. It's inconsistent with what your words are saying, right? Facial expressions, they back up other nonverbal communication and say things like, I understand, or I can feel what you're saying. Facial expressions are infectious, and they can make the entire room light up with a smile or make the whole room doom and gloom, right? Have you ever talked or, or had to work with somebody or <coughs> students in the classroom with someone who never smiles? It's rough, right? Whenever I'm speaking with my students and they don't laugh at my corny jokes, I often <laughs> tell them, wow, rough, rough crowd tonight. And then they laugh just to humor me. Even though I'm thinking, I know that they're thinking, good grief, we only have an hour more of this. <laughs> You weren't supposed to laugh so hard at that one. <laughs> I tell my nursing students that when you're caring for patients to leave your judgments out the door. I love this quote by Abraham Lincoln. It says, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. I love that. If we could all just do that with each other, right? Because let's face it, we all have first impressions of people. But if yours is not so great of someone, maybe talk with them. You know, see what they're about before you make a, a judgment on them. Uh, with nursing, we take care of many types of people, from people distraught, uh, afraid, confused, in denial about their diagnoses, and some who just appear outright crazy, right? But wouldn't it be nice if we could leave our initial judgments at the door? I think we might find that we have a lot more in common with others than we think, okay? All right, so, this is a little video. It's four minutes, a little longer than four minutes that I want to show you all. And I love this video. We all go through a lot in life, all of us each having unique experiences. Some wonderful, some devastating. But let's take a look at this video from the Cleveland Clinic and take a look.
I love that video. I remember when I was at, I first saw this video when I was at orientation for my first nursing job in the OR. There I was <coughs> all day trying to be real professional, you know. And after I saw this, I was bawling in the back of the room. And, and once I start crying, that's it, I can't shut it off. So all day my face looked like somebody had just like, I don't know, smushed my face into the wall. It was horrible, but I, it really spoke to me. Um, it reminded me that you never know what someone else is going through. It reminded me that um, I need to leave my judgment of others at the door. And it taught me to ignore gossip about others and get to know people through my own communications before coming to a conclusion. Be my own thinker. You know, be my own person when it came to judging others. Because often what I found is that it's a lack of communication between people um, that causes tension in the environment. And they may be going through something. Any type of tension in the environment may ha not have anything to do with you. So keep that in mind. The power of a smile. Okay. What does a smile do for our health? So what I want you all to do is close your eyes. Everyone close their eyes. And when I count to three, you're gonna open your eyes, make eye contact with people around you. And you're gonna smile really big, okay? All right? You ready? Yep. Keep your eyes closed. <laughs> One, two, three. Smile, super big. <laughs> Let me see those big pearly whites. Good job. Don't you feel better? Didn't, wasn't that just like uh, uplifting, right? Positive energy. According to an article in American Nurse Today uh, titled Laugh, Nurse, Laugh, there are different types of smiles, but the most genuine and notable is what's called a Duchesne smile. And that is this here. That uh, smile was named after the emotional expression researcher, Guy, I'm not gonna pronounce this right, Guillaume Duchesne. The Duchesne smile is one where you not only smile with the muscles of your mouth, your cheeks raise up, your eyes squint, and you have those crow's feet, right? When you have a Duchesne smile, which is this one right here, it's a, uh, Similar to kindness, the effects are similar to kindness. The brain releases neurotransmitters like dopamine, endorphins, and serotonin, which produce feelings of happiness, the body's natural antidepressants. This is true of forced smiles as well. So force those smiles. I tell my students, smile even when you don't want to. It'll make you feel better. Smiling reduces stress. Kraft and Pressman had a study that they conducted which they recruited participants to engage in stressful multitasking activities and some were instructed to smile and others were not. And the results showed that smiling during brief stressful situations can reduce the body's stress response regardless of whether the smile was genuine or not. Research shows that smiling is contagious, you all. Just witnessed that. You all smiled at each other. When you smile, you're considered more approachable, more relaxed, more positive, okay? And people wanna be around you. Um, it's also important for job interviews. My nurses who are about to, and other students in other programs who are about to graduate, job interviews, smile and smile a lot. Don't go in there with a pasted smile on your face. <laughs> But smile, practice, practice those smiles. Okay, so you see communication matters. The way you make others feel can directly impact the way you feel. And the way we communicate with others, whether it's verbally or non-verbally, directly impacts others around us. We never know what's going on in others' lives. The power of a kind word, the power of a smile, the effects of positive verbal and nonverbal communication have the ability to change the very environments in which we work, live, and play in. So my challenge to all of you is to go out into your lives creating positive vibes for others you come in contact with. You never know what impact you can have on someone else's life 
through the power of positive communication. And I leave you all with one of my favorite quotations. In the end, a person is only known by the impact he or she has on others. And what is it going to be, positive or negative? You decide. Thank you.